So thank you, Chris, for the introduction. And then, of course, thanks to Catalyst Hub for giving me this opportunity to present a very, very recent work. It's actually the first experiment we've done. It's actually July this year. And then the second one is a few weeks ago. And here we are going to talk about extremely fast process. And to study those process, it is not possible uh, without uh, X-rays or without the uh, light beams. And actually, I know nothing about them until I come to the UK. Uh, Richard and Graham introduced me to the Catalyst Hub, and then I know that we can apply for beam times for synchrotron facilities. We did our first in situ beam time in 2018, and that is how I get to know X-rays. And finally, we will be able to perform some experiments with the X-ray free electron lasers that we can see the fundamental of our breaking process here. And that's why we call the study of timing catalysis. And then the first speaker, Martin, also discussed that at the time, it's actually very, very important in catalysis. For whatever chemical reactions, we can always uh, have this rate equation, and then reactions are always as a function of time. In particular, the reaction constant K here is basically written in how, describe how fast the reaction can take a place. For example, we can, in catalysis, especially for heterogeneous catalysis, we can plot the K as a function of a different catalyst. That's why we describe the behaviors of the different catalytic performances. We can also plot K as a function of temperature. That's how we can extrapolate and use our Arrhenius equation to determine the activation energy of the reaction. What is the barriers that molecules need to overcome with the help of the catalyst? We can also do activate, um, stability tests, and that's how we know the, the function of K as, of, as it um, changes when the catalyst uh, structure is changing during the deactivation. So this K is de de determines how long does it take for a tunnel frequency. About the, to introduce a tunnel frequency, I want to use the movies that my colleague Mihail Stamatakis that simulated is the CO oxidation reaction on the surface of a gold, eight gold atoms as a catalytic active size sitting on the surface of a magnesium oxide. You can see that the reaction takes place is that the CO absorbs on the surface and then it reacts with the oxygen. It has oxygen-oxygen dissociation and then finally form a CO2. And then another CO molecule is absorbed on the surface and the react with the, uh, the rest amount of the oxygen and then form another CO2 molecule. And this is what we call a turnover. And if I break down this turnover process into very simple uh, illustrations, it's that the molecules need to diffuse to the surface. And then it will do the surface absorption processes, undergo several stages of a surface reaction, improving, uh, including the migration of the species, the breaking, bound breaking, and bound formation processes, the formation of a multi stabilized uh, <clears throat> transient intermediate species the desorption, and finally, the diffusion back into the, in, in, into the gas phase. So if we can play around with our velocities and our temperatures, then we can get rid of the diffusion limitations. And that is the pink uh, square here. What we are discussing about is the turnover frequency. And then we all, and if you just discuss the surface species, then we are talking about the intermediates, and finally, the bound breaking process in a single reaction, which should be a very fast process. However, the, our turnover frequency that we measured in the catalytic reactor is averaged out by a lot of failed absorptions. I can have a, a, a thousand molecules absorbed on the surface or absorbed on the surface of my catalytic active site, but maybe only one of them will actually start the reaction. So the rest of the 900 of them are basically failed absorption. That's why we see very low turnover frequency. And the Martin already described that usually the turnover frequency is between uh, 100, probably 1,000 seconds minus one, or all the way to 10 to the order of minus three, so, then, uh, minus one. so basically the fastest turnover we can measure is usually in the micro millisecond region, not even microseconds. But actually we think that if it's an effective absorption on the surface, from the absorption to finally to the desorption process, this should be very fast. This is a be, actually should be in the order of nanosecond region or even below one, one nanosecond. And this is so fast that it's impossible for us using conventional in situ spectroscopy to study them. So let me just plot again, as our first speaker, the function of time and what happens at different time scales. So we measure in the lab, in, the, in our reactors, the turnover frequency is usually between the seconds and the millisecond regions. We think 
and we try to capture the quasi-stable intermediate species that is usually in the microsecond or the nanosecond region. Already at here is already quite difficult. So normal synchrotron region won't do that. And then the surface bound breaking the formation process is usually we think within femtosecond to one picosecond region. And this is a very fast process. The question is that can we shoot the actual molecular movies or called complete turnover? And that means that we need very fast beams. And the other thing is that the reaction, the molecules are also very small. As Sarah discussed about, they are usually in the, in the nanometer size. An atom is below one nanometer. And so we also need to have a beam that has the similar wavelengths of the atoms. That's why we think that we need a very fast X-ray to be able to capture the process. Of course, the X-ray scene that we usually have in the lab or in the third generation synchrotrons are not fast enough. Here I plot some common resolutions with the synchrotron X-rays that we studied in our group. For example, this is our very first in situ work at BAT in diamond light source. But we are measuring a copper catalyst over Syria, which is atomic copper side. And then we can use CO to reduce it onto the copper one class, but not to the metallic copper. We are measuring in the fluorescence mode, and the time resolution is three minutes. If you want to increase the time resolution, you can do QZAFs, like, like the super ZAFs in uh, three sex cells, or we can also do the energy dispersive XAFs at I20 EDE, which is very challenging for samples because they don't like solid samples. We still manage to do that, and then we can do the unit transmission mode. We measure the exact same catalyst, but we are measuring the serial L3 edges to see under the CO that partially the serial 4 plus is reduced to serial 3 plus, and then the time resolution for one spectra is about two seconds. You can actually push forward to the limit of the uh, ID detectors. And then this is something that we have done recently. We are investigating the formation and nucleation of copper nanoparticles, which can be used for plasmonic applications. And then our time resolution is five milliseconds per spectrum. And with that, we can see the initial reduction processes as well as the nucleation processes as that happens all within one single second. So this is already quite fast process. However, this is not a limit of diamond. So the fastest uh, the time resolution we can have in B18 is roughly about 200 milliseconds. And for the iPhone ADE, if you use the Germanium solid detector, it's possible to get two microseconds per spectrum. With the upgrade of the diamond two, then we are possible to have the swift, uh, um, the swift beam line, and that beam line can give us roughly about two millisecond per spectrum for very nice uh, hard X-ray ZAF spectroscopy that is similar to the super ZAF showed in the first talk. But that is the limit. So for synchrotron techniques, it's not possible in continuous mode to go beyond a microsecond. And if you want to do that, then we as a materials person people or we as a catalyst uh, society are not familiar with the pump probe techniques. But this is actually a very mature techniques in the photochemistries or for photovoltaics. And it's actually also this, such a pump probe techniques is also a Nobel Prize for chemistry in 1999. So what happens is that uh, you have a system, for example, like a, a semiconductor, a conflict optical wavelengths will excite electrons from a wavelength band to the conduction band. So we call this an excited state. And then after a few femtoseconds or a few um, picoseconds, another probe laser, which is usually in the similar wavelength of this pump laser, is hitting the sample. And by measuring the transmission of the probe lasers, we know the property of the excited state. We know how long the excited state will last. And this is very actually very common for femtosecond chemistry. But for catalysis or for to measuring the, for example, the bound breaking and, and the formation processes, we need to change the probe laser wavelengths all the way to the X-ray region. And actually, actually if exactly at the same super dark thin lines, they have already installed such a pump probe techniques, and you can have the time resolution about 100 nanoseconds to one millisecond. The only limitation is that you can only measure liquid samples with the liquid jet, which is not ideal for heterogeneous catalysis. And so, but this is actually still quite slow. We are talking about the bound breaking process about uh, a few femtoseconds or at least less than <coughs> uh, picoseconds. So even for the pump probe at, at the normal synchrotron, our time resolution is not, not high enough. 
And actually, if you uh, if we look at the technology that is available here, there's a big gap between one nanosecond and one picosecond. We don't have the super technology to determine what is happening over there. So that is why until now we can only compute. Or even for, even for computational studies, it's very difficult to do, to visualize what happens between time zero and one nanosecond. We cannot compute a turnover frequency, a, turn, a complete turnover as a function of time. And this is only possible with the introduction of very fast X-ray beam, beams, that is in the femtosecond houses of X-ray beams. That's why we call it the X-ray free electron laser. Okay, I'm just the user of the X-rays, so I do not know too many things about the particle accelerators. I know that it's a linear shaped particle accelerator, we call it the fourth generation. It creates very fast beams, for example, in the EU X scales, the beam, the wavelength, the length of the single pulse is about three femtoseconds. It's very fast, it's very bright, and then, and also it's very expensive. There are, uh, however, only a handful of available X files available around the world. We have the EU X files in Germany, which UK is one of the members of the EU X files. The Swiss X files in the Paul Sharing Institute, the LCLS in the US, as well as the PAL ones in Korea, and then the SATRA in Japan. There's a, a sixth one, which is the Shanghai Expels that will be open to a uh, user in 2025. So most of our work have been done at the PAL Expels, and in the future, of course, we also hope to perform studies in the EU Expels. We can categorize the existing six external facilities into two groups. One of them costs roughly about 1 billion euros. They are the EU Excels, the Shanghai ones, and also the US Excel. The major difference is about the repetition rate. So EU Excel have 27,000 K of repetition rates. That means in one second, they have 27,000 X-ray pulses hitting your sample. And then for the Shanghai ones and the US ones, it's about 1 million. And that's why, that's why it costs roughly about 1 billion euros. There are cheaper ones, which is only cost about uh, one third of the price, and they only have very low repetition rates. That means that you can only do single scan measurement. Then that mean, also means that with a confined beam time, the amount of experiment you can do with those three uh, x files are very limited. And the wavelengths it can go all the way up to uh, 15 kV or 20 kV, and they are extremely bright. So I just make a comparison with the fourth generation of synchrotron, the extremely brightly uh, source of the EU, ESRF, which is usually about the 10 to the orders of 21 uh, in terms of brilliance. However, for the, e, for the X files, they're usually in the region uh, of 10 to the 32 or 10 to the 33. So they have really a lot of photons hitting the sample. I just want to give a one another number is the, the power density of the X file. And if you can concentrate or you confine the the beam into a focus beam into very small areas, then the beam intensity you get is about a turn to the orders of 17 watt per square centimeters. As a comparison, the total amount of sunlight shining on the earth is also about the same power. Just imagine that you just concentrate them all the way in the sunlight on the earth all the way to only one square centimeters of area, and that is how bright the x source is. And of course, if it happens to stick a sum into that, and then you won't find it anymore. It will explode within one nanosecond. So now I'm going to introduce our experiment at the EU Excel. It's a catalytic experiment, but it's not a very simple one. But before that, please allow two minutes of time to introduce what's the background of this research. So we, in my group, we have been focusing on these copper serial materials for the last 10, nine or 10 years. And then we are interested in the, the size of the surface copper species of, of Syria, which means when you have the atomic size, because of the electro restoring effect of the series, we can, it can bring down the homo energy and also improve the lumen energy. And this we think that can uh, successfully activate the molecular oxygen. And that will show very good activity in oxidation chemistry. We applied for steel oxidation and we also applied for uh, ammonia oxidation reactions. As we can see here that we, uh, can study the performance, uh, the behavior of the copper under in situ conditions. We use the CO to reduce it, and we found that the copper is the atomic size is only reduced to copper one plus. It won't go to the metallic copper, and then the coordination numbers is reduced to four to two, and it forms this kind of linear coordination uh, with the copper one plus. And then the more important thing is that in the helium, 
we found out that although we don't have any oxygen in the gas phase, uh, the copper is already oxidized from the one plus into two plus, and then from copper two oxygen coordination to copper four coordination with a square plane coordination. So we think that the only possible species that can oxidize the copper is actually the cereal. So the cereal four plus is very oxidative. It can pass into oxygen uh, two plus to copper, and that's how we can do this reaction. And this is the, what we believe. So we try to validate that, and we use the pure cereal as a compound to compare with the one not with copper, <coughs> with the atomic side. And here what we do is the cereal L3H extra absorption spectroscopy, and we are measuring the reduction of the cereal four plus to, to three plus with the presence of CO pulses, and then the oxidation link in the oxygen pulses. You can see that on the CO, the cereal four plus is reduced, and then it's oxidizing on, on, in oxygen. The reduction rate is much slower compared to the oxidation rate. Once we have about 40, 14% of the cereal three plus in the beginning, because cereal has a lot of oxygen vacancies. And then we probably reduced about 16% of cereal, of the pure cereal at the 250 degrees C with CO. However, once we produce a 0 0.6 weight percent of copper onto the cereal systems, we can reduce way more cereal than before. And in total, the, such a 6, 0 0.6 weight percent of copper can help further reduce 17% of the cereal in the system. So, of course, there's, there are two scenarios. The first scenario is that the, um, on average, one copper cation can, we think, that can affect about 7.5 uh, cation of the cereal 4 plus to be reduced by the CO. So, the first scenario will be that uh, I have a copper here, I have eight cereal atoms around copper that is affected by an atom atomic copper site. That, that's why it can be reduced by the, by the uh, CO. Or there's another scenario is that the copper two plus serving as a catalyst to catalyze the solid reaction. So basically originally this 7.5 cereal cannot be reduced by the CO, but by reacting with the copper, then copper just serving as a compound to pass it through the oxygen, the electrons to the cereal, and that's how we can reduce it. That will also means that in such a short time frame, so about 120 seconds, my copper should be oscillating between one plus and two plus for at least seven times or eight times. And probably it's within a second, but more likely it's within maybe one nanosecond because this is a turnover of a catalytic process. And that is how we decided that we want to go for XFL to observe this. However, when we start to talk with the XFL people, we found out that actually the X-ray free, free electron lasers are not really, really built for catalysis. They are basically built by physicists and try to solve in biolo biological problems. There are about 30 beam lines available in x around the world. Only five of them will accept solid samples. The rest of them are only working with liquid. And you can think, okay, then I can do homogeneous catalysis. But actually that's also not true because even though they can work with liquid, they need your metal concentration to be at least 100 millimolar. And I don't think there are too many homogeneous processes that involve in such a high concentration of the metals. And with those, all those five beam lines that we can work in with solid, they all require ultra high vacuum condition. You cannot have gases inside. The maximum pressure you can have is 10 to the minus six bar, which is very, very low. So we need limited our condition and we need limited what we can study. Or we want to study this reaction but it's not that possible currently. And then with the solid samples, another problem is that we need to use the pump probe technique to excite the sample or to heat the sample or to excite the sample. But the laser, as well as the extra extra beams will also destroy the sample. So that means that when I have maybe one or two extra beams to heat in my sample position, my sample is already exploded because of the columbic explosion. So you can only measure once or twice of the same sample location. I need to change the sample constantly. That's why we use the technique called the raster scan. So basically we are scanning as a, we have a thin plate of our materials coated thin film, and we are, we are constantly scanning at different location of our catalyst. So at each location, this will only be heating by two XL lasers and one optical laser. The first XL lasers will heat in the sample to measure the ground state. The second lasers will heat in the sample to excite our sample to the excited state. And then the third laser of XL lasers will hit the sample to measure the excited state. By controlling the delay time between the 
optical laser and XR lasers. This is how we obtain femtosecond resolution. The optical laser uh, wavelength in the PAR is about 15 femtoseconds. The XR laser is about 110 femtoseconds. That's how it determines that our time resolution is about 110 femtoseconds. And that's how we can determine it. The other thing we do think about is how to trigger the reaction. For example, if you want to, want to measure the C oxidation reactions, I need to flow CO inside. Even though we are measuring, so even though if we can even measure under the CO, we cannot trigger the reaction with the CO molecules because that we can only we will measure the time frame of the CO diffused on the surface, not the CO absorption and not the CO bond CO oxidation. So we cannot trigger the reaction by heat by gases. We can also not trigger the reaction by just thermal thermally heating the sample because then we are measuring the very slow heating process. The phonon process is extremely small, extremely slow. That's why for most of the pump probe studies, we can only use lasers. We can only do photochemistry and we can, this is the only source of a trigger of the reaction. And then of course, we also need to worry about the beam damage of sample, which I'm going to discuss in detail later. So we happen to find a reaction that can be studied at XFL. Actually, we, also, we found this in the BO7, uh, in Greg's beam line in diamond, that when they have an atomic copper site on the surface of a serial or other support, when I'm hitting the samples, I, the, the support will release oxygen and my copper two plus will reduce to copper one plus. This is a very similar process, similar to the reduction by CO. It's just here, just hitting on the, in the vacuum. And then we compare two, three different types of a copper oxygen bond. The difference is that on the other side of oxygen, I have a different cations. And then this will dramatically change their thermodynamics or the equilibrium states. The temperature required to reduce these three bonds are completely different. And the, this one, the copper oxygen serial bond, which represents the atomic copper side, only requires 50 degrees C. That's why we decide that we are going to use this compound to study uh, our reaction. So we first, very first experiment at XFL is that we try to reproduce what we see at the BO7 in Greg's beam line. What we have seen here is that this is the measurement, measurement of the in, initial uh, copper L3 edge near a star spectroscopy using the ultra electron. We see the copper two plus peaks here. We thermally heat it up and measure the ground state again. And we found that the copper two plus peak increases and the copper one plus peak is decreasing. So we know that the heating on the XL, we can also reproduce exactly the same experiment as we did at BO7C. And then we introduce one uh, atmosphere with pressure of air at room temperature. After one hour, we pump it to ultra, ultra high vacuum again. And we measure it, we found out that, okay, then the absorption of oxygen did oxidize partially of the copper, the copper two plus. So we can reproduce exactly what we have done at synchrotron with the XL facility. And then we start with the pump probe. And here we measure, we see the laser on and the laser off process. The laser on process is, up, is roughly up to the 500 picosecond, uh, femtosecond. You can see that the copper two plus peaks does did, did, did decrease because of the uh, laser heating. And then we can plot the energy at the, mm -hmm. the intensity of this uh, signal at the energy position of the 930 as a function of the delay time we have between the XR pulses as well as the optical pulses. What we found here is that there's a rapid decay of intensity in the very first 250 femtoseconds. And this is due to the photo bleaching process, which is quite normal for, uh, for this type of chemistry. And then the signal come back and then stabilizes between one or two picoseconds. We can also measure a little bit longer delay time up to one nan nanosecond. And what you can see here is that the, here, the signal is very weak. And that's how, because the optical lasers is hitting the sample and it causes the uh, explosion of the sample and the explosion happens at one nanosecond. That's why we can only measure the time frame between the time zero, or let's say the minus time, all the way to one nanoseconds with 150 femtoseconds of time resolution. The conclusion is that the breaking of this bond at atomic copper side requires between one to two picoseconds. And I won't give you details about this process here because it involves at least three different types of processes, but I can answer that in the Q&A session. In the next step, we are thinking about 
What about changing the other side of the cations here? What about changing another cation? Do this will will are we going to see exactly the same dynamics, or we are going to see different dynamics? So what we do is that we actually reoxidize the sample with CO two because CO two can bond quite nicely on the surface from the carbonate. And then we think about then we just uh, use the laser to heat it up, and then we can see the breaking of the copper oxygen carbon bond. So we first just measure a synchrotron with a CO2 absorption, and we did see that after CO2 absorption and from auto action, then we can see that we still have the copper 2 plus there. The CO2 bound quite nicely, even when we go to the auto action condition. And then we can just heat it up, and then we can see the uh, reduction of the copper. And then we can plot the reduction temperature of the copper as a function of temperature. And compared to the fresh catalyst or to the ones that oxidize with oxygen, we found out that the CO2 actually can dissolve quite easily. It will require less temperature. But of course, this is measured at the equilibrium state. What about the, the, the dynamic state or the uh, uh, dynamic state? So we then measure the, the same spectra at XL and we validate their uh, beam damage of the sample. And we can see that beam really damages our samples. This is what we measured in the Russell scan that every sample only heated by two XL beams. And here we measured with the uh, at the same sample position, and thus reduce the copper two plus copper one plus. This also shows why it's important to do the Russell scan. And then we did the exact same pump probe experiment, and we found out that okay, yes, we also found that the copper two plus is reduced to copper one plus. As compared to here, we also see this. But uh, this is for the copper oxygen carbon bond, and here's for the copper oxygen serial bond. And then we can plot again the intensity as a function of delay time, and here we see a much faster mm -hmm. process. So. With the, even with the different laser powers, we can see the reduction within the very first 500 picoseconds. And even here, it's roughly about one picosecond. So we can then plot the process of these two bound breaking processes as a function of time. And the first one takes be below one picosecond. The second one takes between one and two picoseconds. And this dynamics actually fit quite nicely to the equilibrium because also this one requires less heat to, dis to dissolve it, which will allow to break the bulb. So it's the first time that we can show that such a dynamics of that at the femtosecond regime correlates quite well to what we observed in the equilibrium state that measured with uh, minutes or even hours. So with that, I want to conclude that we have been studying this system for nine years, and we constantly trying to improve our time resolution. And finally, we can do this type of experiment with very high time resolutions, and finally, we are already have the funding for the UK XL in the first stage. And hopefully after 20 years, me or my students can perform even more advanced uh, experiment here in the UK. Okay, so what will be the key taking home message? We know that for the bound breaking process with our study, we first have to show that on the surface, it will take between one to two picoseconds. I found the two literatures that discuss about the bond formation process, which is also one picoseconds, and that fits nicely with what we are observing here. However, for the desorption process, it's much longer. It takes six or seven picoseconds. Combining our work with these two papers, then we think we can bring a complete picture about the time scale that a molecule is reacting on the surface within picosecond scale, and then dissolve from the surface in the six or seven picosecond scale. Of course, we cannot measure in the absorption because it's, and this is a philosophical question, what is the time or what is the state of absorption? And that's very difficult to do. So with that, I would like to say that before XL or before our experiment, we are only in this region. So we only know the turnover. We maybe know some intermediate species, but we have no idea how fast it is for surface absorption and breaking. And with our work and also with other works, uh, from Stanford, then it's possible that we can observe those bound breaking dynamics in a femtosecond regime. And now's the time of us to sh actually shoot in the molecular movies, movies and to observe the complete turnovers within the time scale and understand how much does it take to complete one single turnover in a catalytic reaction. So I would say that it's, it is a very small step that we are doing as an extra experiment, but maybe it can be a one giant leap for catalysis that we can actually know how fast the process is happening. Thank you very much. And also, um, this is my conclusion. And also, this is the collaborators and students I need to thank, especially for the UK Catalyst Hub. Thank you. Hi,
and thank you very much Steve, for, for an inspiring resource. Question. Well, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Ryan, for a really exciting talk, showing how these techniques come really beginning to allow us to understand the operation of processes. Because one of the problems with the Stark techniques is that there's a huge, enormously intense X ray field that destroys the thing you're studying. Um, um, have we got something to learn from the kind of molecular biology field? Okay, so the research questions regarding um, the molecular biology systems, they also measured as well, but they also have the same problems. What they do is that at, when they have the list of proteins and they do I try to do in the protein, uh, protein diffractions, and then every time each beam is shooting at the different protein molecules. And that is how they can get away from the beam damage. But in our case, because we are doing heterogeneous catalysis, we have a solid samples. So there will be two solutions. Either we can de develop a mechanical way that we can shoot a solid beam into, our, into a sample chamber. And each time the extra pulses will hitting a different solid particles. If that is possible, then you will solve all the problems. Or we do the raster scan, what I showed here. So we always measure a different sample location, but this is a very slow process because the raster scan will maximally be like 16 hertz or 100 hertz so we cannot go really fast and this is a major problem for if you want to apply a proposal for the eu excels because in eu excel the two extra pulses will only have two nanoseconds in distance that means that they want you to change the sample location in two nanoseconds this is not possible with the raster scan so that's why um but that, that's why it's extremely difficult but I think in the future, there will be a way to do that, either by this way or by the shooting the solid particle beams into the system, like just aerosol into the system. And we can just actually collecting one some, measuring one particle at the same time, at one time. Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, two questions at the back here. Um, thank you for this interesting talk. And my question is about the time. Um, your main point of this lecture is about time, you're talking about it, somehow the kinetic of these different steps. Like, my question is and about if one which is specific example, or reaction or the surface, how you can correlate that to these are not proof of happiness? And is there any means that you give us some? Uh, but I think the time is very important, and you know, but how you can. Yeah, so the question is regarding how the study of us or the study of Excel can help to improve the uh, catalytic performance of a real catalyst in the world. And it's very difficult to answer this question. And we are in the very beginning stages. So ideally, we want to observe, if I may go to my slides, ideally, if we want to observe the process of this one experimentally, so we know how long does it take for each process. Then we can capture the slowest process and understand why this process is the slowest one. And that's how we can then develop catalysts to accelerate this process, to improve this. And, and, and that will be the time that we can say that, okay, our studies can really help to improve a practical catalyst in the real world. But I would say currently we are still very, very far away from that because we only can study very limited chemical process now on the surface. It's still very, long way to go. And adding to that, so I also found in mind that myself is quite lonely. So there are not so many people doing similar research around the world and probably one or two groups. And it would be great that we have a lot of people in the UK are interested in this and we can do this together. Shanghai. Uh, I have a question about the beam damage. Yep. Um, <clears throat> um, not, I've not experienced it because of 
Uh, is the photon energy required for the time resolution or is it a consequence of the time resolution? In a sense that can you put like filters before the sample to reduce the photon intensity but still keeping the same time resolution or they are directly correlated? Okay, the time resolution is not related to the energy of the uh, the instant beam. It's two completely different things. So basically, you can have a instant beam between uh, nano nanometers in wavelengths, or between or at uh, several hundreds of nanometers in wavelengths. They can all have, for example, fifty femtoseconds of uh, pulse lenses. So the, the, that's not related to the beam energy. Also, talking more in the photon the amount of photons. The amount of photons is depending, yes, the amount of photons is basically we are talking about the amplitude of the electromagnetic wave, and that is depending on the, your source, and that's also not limiting by the, uh, the, the time resolution here. Why don't we put filters in front of it? Just heavy elements absorb most of the photons, and you get some of the down. Yes, but then you don't get a signal. Uh, this is a very good question. I also have this question when I was measured, when I was asking my colleagues in the Excel, you can see the error bar here. So each dot here, we're measuring 200 times. And this, so that means that each dot is a 200 different times of a sample location. We average them out and there's still a very huge error bar. So, and then if you reduce, and this is by hitting the very high photo flux. And then if you reduce the photo flux, we don't get any electron out here. We don't, we don't detect it anymore. Just imagine, because it's not compared to the synchrotron, we are measuring a spectra within one minute. And now we're just measuring one single spectra, one spectra within 10 to the minus 15 seconds. The amount of photons hitting the sample and the amount of electrons getting out of the sample in ultra electron yield is very small compared to the one uh, second of measurement. Thank you. Okay, um, Josie, are there any questions in the chat? Uh, there's a couple. Um, so the, the first is the desorption time of six picoseconds for the CO on ruthenium 0001 was excited by what force? Uh, that is also laser. <laughs> okay, the laser. And how about the relationship of time and drive force for bond breaking or desorption? Uh, can you repeat the question? Um, how about the relationship of time and driving force for bond breaking or desorption? Is there any relationship? Yes, of course, because the... Actually, I don't know how to correctly answer the question. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think with a stronger driving force, the time should be shorter. That's what I think. But this may be wrong, and uh, we don't even know whether I'm wrong or I'm correct or wrong unless we measure it. So it's quite, I, I don't know how to directly answer the question. I, I think it is related. Okay, I think we'll have to leave it there. I know there was a number of other questions, but I think we'll have to leave that till the post session. We'd like to thank Ryan again. Thank you very much. for an excellent talk. <laughs>